Hello there. Jordan was the first one on today. Hello, Jordan. I hope you're very well on this Saturday. And if you, uh, I don't know if you were on in time because just as I turned on the camera, Barnaby, who is our little cat, went across the front. Barnaby's not a very good internet cat. He really doesn't know what is needed of him for the internet. He needs to sit on my lap as I read. That would be a good internet cat. Barnaby isn't that. He's more cagey. My name is Gilbert Jackson, and I'm an actor, and I'm also doing these fireside readings, and I hope you are enjoying them as much as I am, because I thoroughly enjoy reading to you these classic old books. I've also done a lot of audiobook narration, so uh, this is sort of what I do, although it's a new thing, and uh, I love that so many people seem to be enjoying it. Uh, you can enjoy it on Instagram, 5 Pacific Every Day Live, at Fireside Reading, or you can join it at uh, the YouTube channel Fireside Reading, where we upload everything after every reading. So there, now there's hours and hours of uh, classic audiobooks read to you in front of the fire. And today, we are going to continue with The 39 Steps by John Buckham. We're on chapter six, and he has been escaping the black Stone, which is an organization. We don't really know who they are yet. He was told about them, and they've proved to be real. They're after him for the murder of the American in his apartment, as are the police. He's running from them on the Scottish moors, and that's where we find ourselves at the beginning of Chapter 6. So welcome to a fireside reading of the 39 steps. Chapter six, the adventure of the bald archeologist. I spent the night on a shelf of the hillside in the lee of a boulder where the heather grew long and soft. It was a cold business for I had neither coat nor waistcoat these were in Mr. Turnbull's keeping, as was Scudder's little book, my watch, and worst of all, my pipe and tobacco pouch. Only my money accompanied me in my belt, and about half a pound of ginger biscuits in my trouser pocket. I supped off half those biscuits, and by worming myself deep into the heather got some kind of warmth. My spirits had risen, and I was beginning to enjoy this crazy game of hide-and-seek. So far, I had been miraculously lucky. The milkman, the literary innkeeper, Sir Harry, the roadman, and the idiotic Marmy were all pieces of undeserved good fortune. Somehow, the first success gave me a feeling that I was going to pull the thing through. My chief trouble was that I was desperately hungry, when a man shoots himself in the city and there is an inquest, the papers usually report that the deceased was well-nourished. I remember thinking that they could not call me well-nourished if I broke my neck in a bog hole. I lay and tortured myself, for the ginger biscuits merely emphasized the aching void with the memory of all the good food I'd thought so little of in London. There were Paddock's crisp sausages and fragrant shavings of bacon <laughs> and shapely poached eggs. How often I had turned up my nose at them. There were the cutlets they did at the club and a particular ham that stood on the cold table for which my soul lusted. My thoughts hovered over all varieties of mortal edible and finally settled on a porterhouse steak and a quart of bitter with a Welsh rabbit to follow. In longing hopelessly for these dainties, I fell asleep. 
I woke very cold and stiff about an hour after dawn. It took me a little while to remember where I was, for I'd been very weary and had slept heavily. I saw first a pale blue sky through a net of heather, then a big shoulder of hill, and then my own boots placed neatly in a blueberry bush. I raised myself on my arms and looked down into the valley. And that one look set me lacing up my boots in mad haste, for there were men below, not more than a quarter of a mile off, spaced out on the hillside like a fan and beating the heather. Marmy had not been slow in looking for his revenge. I crawled out of my shelf into the cover of a boulder and from it gained a shallow trench which slanted up the mountain face. This led me presently into the narrow gully of a burn by way of which I scrambled to the top of the ridge. From there I looked back and saw that I was still undiscovered. My pursuers were patiently quartering the hillside and moving upwards. Keeping behind the skyline, I ran for maybe half a mile till I judged I was above the uppermost end of the glen. Then I showed myself and was instantly noted by one of the flankers who passed the word to the others. I heard cries coming up from below and saw that the line of search had changed its direction. I pretended to retreat over the skyline, but instead went back the way I had come and in 20 minutes was behind the ridge overlooking my sleeping place. From that viewpoint, I had the satisfaction of seeing the pursuit streaming up the hill at the top of the glen on a hopelessly false scent. I had before me a choice of routes and I chose a ridge which made an angle with the one I was on, and so would soon put a deep glen between me and my enemies. The exercise had warmed my blood, and I was beginning to enjoy myself, amazingly. As I went, I breakfasted on the dusty remnants of the ginger biscuits. I knew very little about the country, and I hadn't a notion what I was going to do. I trusted to the strength of my legs, but I was well aware that those behind me would be familiar with the lie of the land and that my ignorance would be a heavy handicap. I saw in front of me a sea of hills rising high towards the south, but northwards breaking down into broad ridges which separated wide and shallow dales. The ridge I had chosen seemed to sink after a mile or two to a moor which lay like a pocket in the upland. That seemed as good a direction to take as any other. My stratagem had given me a fair start, call it 20 minutes, and I had the width of a glen behind me before I saw the first heads of the pursuers. The police had evidently called in local talent to their aid, and the men I could see had the appearance of herds or gamekeepers. They hallooed at the sight of me, and I waved my hand. Two dived into the glen and began to climb my ridge, while the others kept their own side of the hill. I felt as if I were taking part in a schoolboy game of hare and hounds. But very soon it began to seem less of a game. Those fellows behind were hefty men on their native heath. Looking back, I saw that only three were following direct, and I guessed that the others had fetched a circuit to cut me off. My lack of local knowledge might very well be my undoing, and I resolved to get out of this tangle of glens to the pocket of more I had seen from the tops. I must so increase my distance as to get clear away from them, and I believed I could do this if I could find the right ground for it. If there had been cover, I would have tried a bit of stalking, but on these bare slopes you could see a fly a mile off. My hope must be in the length of my legs and the soundness of my wind. But I needed easier ground for that, for I was not bred a mountaineer. How I longed for a good Africander pony. 
I put on a great spurt and got off my ridge and down into the moor before any figures appeared on the skyline behind me. I crossed a burn and came out on a high road which made a pass between two glens. All in front of me was a big field of heather sloping up to a crest which was crowned with an odd feather of trees. In the dike by the roadside was a gate from which a grass-grown track led over the first wave of the moor. I jumped the dike and followed it, and after a few hundred yards, as soon as it was out of sight of the highway, the grass stopped and it became a very respectable road which was evidently kept with some care. Clearly, it ran to a house, and I began to think of doing the same. Hitherto, my luck had held, and it might be that my best chance would be found in this remote dwelling. Anyhow, there were trees there, and that meant cover. I did not follow the road, but the burn side, which flanked it on the right, where the bracken grew deep, and the high banks made a tolerable screen. It was well I did so, for no sooner had I gained the hollow than looking back I saw the pursuit topping the ridge from which I had descended. After that I did not look back. I had no time. I ran up the burnside, crawling over the open places, and for a large part wading in the shallow stream. I found a deserted cottage with a row of phantom peat stacks and an overgrown garden. Then I was among young hay and very soon had come to the edge of a plantation of wind-blown firs. From there, I saw the chimneys of the house smoking a few hundred yards to my left. I forsook the burnside, crossed another dike, and almost before I knew it was on a rough lawn a glance back told me that I was well out of sight of the pursuit, which had not yet passed the first lift of the moor. The lawn was a very rough place, cut with a scythe instead of a mower, and planted with beds of scrubby rhododendron. A brace of black game, which are not usually garden birds, rose at my approach, the house before me was the ordinary moorland farm with a more pretentious whitewashed wing added. Attached to this wing was a glass veranda, and through the glass I saw the face of an elderly gentleman meekly watching me. I stalked over the border of coarse hill gravel and entered the open veranda door. Within was a pleasant room, glass on one side and on the other, a mass of books. More books showed in an inner room. On the floor, instead of tables, stood cases, such as you see in a museum, filled with coins and queer stone implements. There was a knee-hole desk in the middle, and seated at it with some papers and open volumes before him was the benevolent old gentleman. His face was round and shiny, like Mr. Pickwick's big glasses were stuck on the end of his nose, and the top of his head was as bright and bare as a glass bottle. He never moved when I entered, but raised his placid eyebrows and waited for me to speak. It was not an easy job with about five minutes to spare to tell a stranger who I was and what I wanted and to win his aid. I did not attempt it. There was something about the eye of the man before me, something so keen and knowledgeable that I could not find a word. I simply stared at him and stuttered. You seem to be in a hurry, my friend, he said slowly. I nodded toward the window. It gave a prospect across the moor through a gap in the plantation and revealed certain figures half a mile off, straggling through the heather. Ah, I see, he said, 
and took up a pair of field glasses through which he patiently scrutinized the figures. A fugitive from justice, eh? Well, we'll go into the matter at our leisure. Meantime, I object to my privacy being broken in upon by the clumsy rural policeman. Go into my study and you will see two doors facing you. Take the one on the left and close it behind you. You will be perfectly safe. And this extraordinary man took up his pen again. I did as I was bid and found myself in a little dark chamber which smelt of chemicals and was lit only by a tiny window high up in the wall. The door had swung behind me with a click like the door of a safe. Once again, I had found an unexpected sanctuary. All the same, I was not comfortable. There was something about the old gentleman which puzzled and rather terrified me. He had been too easy and ready, almost as if he had expected me. And his eyes had been horribly intelligent. No sound came to me in that dark place. For all I knew, the police might be searching the house, and if they did... They would want to know what was behind this door. I tried to possess my soul in patience and to forget how hungry I was. Then I took a more cheerful view. The old gentleman could scarcely refuse me a meal, and I fell to reconstructing my breakfast. Bacon and eggs would content me, but I wanted the better part of a flitch of bacon and half a hundred eggs. And then, while my mouth was watering in anticipation, there was a click, and the door stood open. I emerged into the sunlight to find the master of the house sitting in a deep armchair in the room he called his study and regarding me with curious eyes. Have they gone? I asked. They have gone. I convinced them that you had crossed the hills. I do not choose that the police should come between me and one whom I am delighted to honor. This is a lucky morning for you, Mr. Richard Hannay. As he spoke, his eyelids seemed to tremble and to fall a little over his keen grey eyes. In a flash, the phrase of Scudders came back to me when he had described the man he most dreaded in the world. He had said that he could hold his eyes like a hawk. Then I saw that I had walked straight into the enemy's headquarters. My first impulse was to throttle the old ruffian and make for the open air. He seemed to anticipate my intention, for he smiled gently and nodded to the door behind me. I turned and saw two men servants who had me covered with pistols. He knew my name, but he had never seen me before, and as the reflection darted across my mind, I saw a slender chance. I don't know what you mean, I said roughly. And who are you calling Richard Hannay? My name's Ainsley. So, he said, still smiling, but of course you have others. We won't quarrel about a name. I was pulling myself together now, and I reflected that my garb, lacking coat and waistcoat and collar, would at any rate not betray me. I put on my surliest face and shrugged my shoulders. I suppose you're going to give me up after all, 
and I call it a damn dirty trick. My God, I wish I'd never seen that cursed motor car. Here's the money and be damned to you. And I flung four sovereigns on the table. He opened his eyes a little. Oh, no, I shall not give you up. My friends and I will have a little private settlement with you, that is all. You know a little too much, Mr. Hanney. You are a clever actor, but not quite clever enough. He spoke with assurance, but I could see the dawning of a doubt in his mind. Oh, for God's sake, stop jawing, I cried. Everything's against me. I haven't had a bit of luck since I came on shore at Leith. What's the harm in a poor devil with an empty stomach picking up some money he finds in a bust-up motor car? That's all I've done, and for that I've been chivied for two days by those blasted bobbies over those blasted hills. I tell you, I'm fair sick of it. You can do what you like, old boy. Ned Ainsley's got no fight left in him. I could see that the doubt was gaining. Will you oblige me with the story of your recent doings? He asked. I can't, Governor, I said in a real beggar's whine. I've not had a bite to eat for two days. Give me a mouthful of food and then you'll hear the God's truth. I must have showed my hunger in my face, for he signalled to one of the men in the doorway. A bit of cold pie was brought and a glass of beer and I wolfed them down like a pig, or rather, like Ned Ainsley, for I was keeping up my character. In the middle of my meal, he spoke suddenly to me in German, but I turned on him a face as blank as a stone wall. Then I told him my story, how I had come off an archangel ship at Leith a week ago and was making my way overland to my brother at Wigtown. I had run short of cash, I hinted vaguely at a spree, and I was pretty well on my uppers when I had come on a hole in a hedge, had seen a big motor car lying in the burn. I'd poked about to see what had happened and had found three sovereigns lying on the seat and one on the floor. There was nobody there or any sign of an owner, so I had pocketed the cash. But somehow... The law had got after me. When I tried to change a sovereign in a baker's shop, the woman had cried on the police, and a little later, when I was washing my face in a burn, I had nearly been gripped and had only got away by leaving my coat and waistcoat behind me. They can have the money back, I cried. For a fat lot of good it's done me. Those perishers are all down on a poor man. Now, if it had been you, Governor, that had found the quids, Nobody would have troubled you. You're a good liar, Hannay, he said. I flew into a rage. Stop fooling, damn you. I tell you, my name's Ainsley, and I never heard of anyone called Hannay in my born days. I'd sooner have the police than you with your Hannays and your monkey-faced pistol tricks. No, Governor, I beg pardon. I don't mean that. I'm much obliged to you for the grub, and I'll thank you to let me go. Now the coast's clear. It was obvious that he was badly puzzled. You see, he had never seen me, and my appearance must have altered considerably from my photographs, if he had got one of them. I was pretty smart and well-dressed in London, and now I was a regular tramp. I do not propose to let you go. If you are what you say you are, you will soon have a chance of clearing yourself. If you are what I believe you are, I do not think you will see the light much longer. He rang a bell, and a third servant appeared from the veranda. I want the Lanchester in five minutes, he said. There will be three to luncheon. Then he looked steadily at me, and that was the hardest ordeal of all. 
There was something weird and devilish in those eyes, cold, malignant, unearthly, and most hellishly clever. They fascinated me like the bright eyes of a snake. I had a strong impulse to throw myself on his mercy and offer to join his side, and if you consider the way I felt about the whole thing, you will see that that impulse must have been purely physical, the weakness of a brain mesmerized and mastered by a stronger spirit. But I managed to stick it out and even to grin. You know me next time, Governor, <laughs> I said. Carl, he spoke in German to one of the men in the doorway. You will put this fellow in the storeroom till I return, and you will be answerable to me for his keeping. I was marched out of the room with a pistol at each ear. The storeroom was a damp chamber in what had been the old farmhouse. There was no carpet on the uneven floor and nothing to sit down on but a school form. It was black as pitch, for the windows were heavily shuttered. I made out by groping that the walls were lined with boxes and barrels and sacks of some heavy stuff. The whole place smelt of mold and disuse. My jailers turned the key in the door and I could hear them shifting their feet as they stood on guard outside. I sat down in that chilly darkness in a very miserable frame of mind. The old boy had gone off in a motor to collect the two ruffians who had interviewed me yesterday. Now they had seen me as the roadman and they would remember me for I was in the same rig. What was a roadman doing 20 miles from his beat, pursued by the police? A question or two would put them on the track. Probably they had seen Mr. Turnbull, probably Marmy too. Most likely they could link me up with Sir Harry, and then the whole thing would be crystal clear. What chance had I in this moorland house with three desperados and their armed servants? I began to think wistfully of the police now plodding over the hills after my wraith. They, at any rate, were fellow countrymen and honest men, and their tender mercies would be kinder than these ghoulish aliens. But they wouldn't have listened to me. That old devil with the eyelids had not taken long to get rid of them. I thought he probably had some kind of graft with the constabulary. Most likely he had letters from cabinet ministers saying he was to be given every facility for plotting against Britain. That's the sort of owlish way we run our politics in this jolly old country. The three would be back for lunch, so I hadn't more than a couple of hours to wait. It was simply waiting on destruction, for I could see no way out of this mess. I wished that I had Scudder's courage, for I am free to confess I didn't feel any great fortitude. The only thing that kept me going was that I was pretty furious. It made me boil with rage to think of those three spies getting the pull on me like this. I hoped that at any rate I might be able to twist one of their necks before they downed me. The more I thought of it, the angrier I grew, and I had to get up and move about the room. I tried the shutters, but they were the kind that lock with a key, and I couldn't move them. From the outside came the faint clucking of hens in the warm sun. Then I groped among the sacks and boxes. I couldn't open the latter, and the sacks seemed to be full of things like dog biscuits that smelt of cinnamon. But as I circumnavigated the room... I found a handle in the wall which seemed worth investigating. It was the door of a wall cupboard, what they call a press in Scotland, and it was locked. I shook it and it seemed rather flimsy. 
For want of something better to do, I put out my strength on that door, getting some purchase on the handle by looping my braces round it. Presently, the thing gave with a crash, which I thought would bring in my warders to inquire. I waited for a bit and then started to explore the cupboard shelves. There was a multitude of queer things there. I found an odd vesta or two in my trouser pockets and struck a light. It was out in a second, but it showed me one thing. There was a little stock of electric torches on one shelf. I picked up one and found it was in working order. With the torch to help me, I investigated further. There were bottles and cases of queer-smelling stuff, chemicals, no doubt, for experiments. And there were coils of fine copper wire and yanks and yanks of thin oiled silk. There was a box of detonators and a lot of cord for fuses. Then, away at the back of the shelf, I found a stout brown cardboard box and inside it a wooden case. I managed to wrench it open and within lay half a dozen little grey bricks, each a couple of inches square. I took up one and found that it crumbled easily in my hand. Then I smelt it and put it to my tongue. After that, I sat down to think. I hadn't been a mining engineer for nothing, and I knew lentonite when I saw it. With one of these bricks, I could blow the house to smithereens. I'd used the stuff in Rhodesia and knew its power. But the trouble was that my knowledge wasn't exact. I had forgotten the proper charge and the right way of preparing it, and I wasn't sure about the timing. I had only a vague notion, too, as to its power, for though I had used it, I had not handled it with my own fingers. But it was a chance, the only possible chance. It was a mighty risk, but against it was an absolute black certainty. If I used it, the odds were, as I reckoned, about five to one in favor of my blowing myself into the treetops. But if I didn't, I should very likely be occupying a six-foot hole in the garden by the evening. This was the way I had to look at it. The prospect was pretty dark either way, but anyhow, there was a chance, both for myself and for my country. The remembrance of little Scudder decided me. It was about the beastliest moment of my life, for I'm no good at these cold-blooded resolutions. Still, I managed to rake up the pluck to set my teeth and choke back the horrid doubts that flooded in on me. I simply shut off my mind and pretended I was doing an experiment as simple as Guy Fawkes fireworks. I got a detonator and fixed it to a couple of feet of fuse. Then I took a quarter of a lentonite brick and buried it near the door below one of the sacks in a crack of the floor, fixing the detonator into it. For all I knew, half those boxes might be dynamite. If the cupboard held such deadly explosives, why not the boxes? In that case, there would be a glorious skyward journey for me and the German servants, and about an acre of surrounding country. There was also the risk that the detonation might set off the other bricks in the cupboard, for I had forgotten most that I knew about lentonite. But it didn't do to begin thinking about the possibilities. The odds were horrible, but I had to take them. I ensconced myself just below the sill of the window and lit the fuse. Then I waited for a moment or two. There was dead silence, only a shuffle of heavy boots in the passage and the peaceful cluck of hens from the warm out of doors. I commended my soul to my maker and wondered where I would be in five seconds. A great wave of heat seems to surge upward from the floor and hang for a blistering instant in the air. Then the wall opposite me flashed 
into a golden yellow and dissolved with a rending thunder that hammered my brain into a pulp. Something dropped on me, catching the point of my left shoulder, and then I think I became unconscious. My stupor can scarcely have lasted beyond a few seconds. I felt myself being choked by thick, yellow fumes, and I struggled out of the debris to my feet. Somewhere behind me, I felt fresh air. The jams of the window had fallen, and through the ragged rent, the smoke was pouring out to the summer noon. I stepped over the broken lintel and found myself standing in a yard in a dense and acrid fog. I felt very sick and ill, but I could move my limbs, and I staggered blindly forward away from the house. A small mill lathe ran in a wooden aqueduct at the other side of the yard, and into this I fell. The cool water revived me, and I had just enough wits left to think of escape. I squirmed up the lathe among the slippery green slime till I reached, till I reached the mill wheel. Then I wriggled through the axle hole into the old mill and tumbled onto a bed of chaff. A nail caught the seat of my trousers and I left a wisp of heather mixture behind me. The mill had been long out of use. The ladders were rotten with age and in the loft the rats had gnawed great holes in the floor. Nausea shook me and a wheel in my head kept turning while my left shoulder and arm seemed to be stricken with the palsy. I looked out of the window and saw a fog still hanging over the house and smoke escaping from an upper window. Please God, I had set the place on fire, for I could hear confused cries coming from the other side. But I had no time to linger, since this mill was obviously a bad hiding place. Anyone looking for me would naturally follow the laid, and I made certain the search would begin as soon as they found that my body was not in the storeroom. From another window, I saw that on the far side of the mill stood an old stone dovecot. If I could get there without leaving tracks, I might find a hiding place, for I argued that my enemies, if they thought I could move, would conclude I had made for open country and would go seeking me on the moor. I crawled down the broken ladder, scattering chaff behind me to cover my footsteps. I did the same on the mill floor and on the threshold, where the door hung on broken hinges. Peeping out, I saw that between me and the dovecot was a piece of bare, cobbled ground where no footmarks would show. Also, it was mercifully hid by the mill buildings from any view from the house. I slipped across the space, got to the back of the dovecot, and prospected a way of ascent. That was one of the hardest jobs I ever took on. My shoulder and arm ached like hell, and I was so sick and giddy that I was always on the verge of falling. But I managed it somehow. By the use of out-jutting stones and gaps in the masonry and a rough ivy root, I got to the top in the end. There was a little parapet behind which I found space to lie down, and then I proceeded to go off into an old-fashioned swoon. I woke with a burning head and the sun glaring in my face. For a long time I lay motionless, for those horrible fumes seemed to have loosened my joints and dulled my brain. Sounds came to me from the house, men speaking throatily and the throbbing of a stationary car. There was a little gap in the parapet to which I wriggled and from which I had some sort of prospect of the yard. I saw figures come out, a servant with his head bound up, and then a younger man in knickerbockers. They were looking for something and moved toward the mill. Then one of them caught sight of the wisp of cloth on the nail and cried out to the other. They both went back to the house and brought two more to look at it. I saw the rotund figure of my late captor and thought I made out the man with the lisp. I noticed that all had pistols. For half an hour, they ransacked the mill. I could hear them kicking over the barrels and pulling up the rotten planking. Then they came outside and stood just below the dovecot, 
arguing fiercely. The servant with the bandage was being soundly rated. I heard them fiddling with the door of the dovecot, and for one horrid moment I fancied they were coming up. Then they thought better of it and went back to the house. All that long, blistering afternoon, I lay baking on the rooftop. Thirst was my chief torment. My tongue was like a stick, and to make it worse, I could hear the cool drip of water from the mill lathe. I watched the course of the little stream as it came in from the moor, and my fancy followed it to the top of the glen, where it must issue from an icy fountain fringed with cool ferns and mosses. I would have given a thousand pounds to plunge my face into that. I had a fine prospect of the whole ring of moorland. I saw the car speed away with two occupants and a man on a hill pony riding east. I judged they were looking for me, and I wished them joy on their quest. But I saw something else more interesting. The house stood almost on the summit of a swell of moorland which crowned a sort of plateau, and there was no higher point nearer than the big hills six miles off. The actual summit, as I've mentioned, was a biggish clump of trees, firs mostly, with a few ashes and beeches. On the dovecot, I was almost on a level with the treetops and could see what lay beyond. The wood was not solid, but only a ring, and inside was an oval of green turf, for all the world like a big cricket field. I didn't take long to guess what it was. It was an aerodrome, and a secret one. The place had been most cunningly chosen, for suppose anyone were watching an aeroplane descending here, he would think it had gone over the hill beyond the trees, as the place was on the top of a rise in the midst of a big amphitheater. Any observer from any direction would conclude it had passed out of view behind the hill. Only a man very close at hand would realize that the aeroplane had not gone over, but had descended in the midst of the wood. An observer with a telescope on one of the higher hills might have discovered the truth, but only herds went there, and herds do not carry spyglasses. When I looked from the dovecot, I could see far away a blue line which I knew was the sea, and I grew furious to think that our enemies had this secret conning tower to rake our waterways. Then I reflected that if the aeroplane came back, the chances were ten to one that I would be discovered. So through the afternoon I lay and prayed for the coming of darkness. And glad I was when the sun went down over the big western hills and the twilight haze crept over the moor. The aeroplane was late. The gloaming was far advanced when I heard the beat of wings and saw it volplaning downward to its home in the wood. Lights twinkled for a bit, and there was much coming and going from the house. Then the dark fell, and silence. Thank God it was a black night. The moon was well on its last quarter and would not rise till late. My thirst was too great to allow me to tarry, so at about nine o'clock, so far as I could judge, I started to descend. It wasn't easy, and halfway down I heard the back door of the house open and saw the gleam of a lantern against the mill wall. For some agonizing minutes I hung by the ivy and prayed that whoever it was would not come round by the dovecot. Then the light disappeared, and I dropped as softly as I could onto the hard soil of the yard. I crawled on my belly in the lee of a stone dike till I reached the fringe of trees which surrounded the house. If I had known how to do it, I would have tried to put that aeroplane out of action, but I realized that any attempt would probably be futile. I was pretty certain that there would be some kind of defense round the house, so I went through the wood on hands and knees, feet.
feeling carefully every inch before me. It was as well, for presently I came on a wire about two feet from the ground. If I had tripped over that, it would doubtless have rung some bell in the house and I would have been captured. A hundred yards farther on, I found another wire cunningly placed on the edge of a small stream. Beyond that lay the moor, and in five minutes I was deep in bracken and heather. Soon I was round the shoulder of the rise in the little glen from which the mill lade flowed. Ten minutes later, my face was in the spring, and I was soaking down pints of the blessed water, but I did not stop till I had put half a dozen miles between me and that accursed dwelling. Thank you all for joining me. I hope this helps a little. Please check out the YouTube channel, Fireside Reading, and if you'd like, please subscribe. That would help me. Until I see you next time, please stay.